Good afternoon. So I have a wonderful opportunity right now that I'm going to share with you. And it's to talk to my friend, uh, Dr. Iva Carruthers. I sometimes just call her Iva. <laughs> um, and I'm not going to read her bio. I'll just give you a few high points. She is head of something called the Proctor Conference, which is um, one way of describing it as progressive African-American ministers across the country. And she's been involved in a number of issues, uh, especially around incarceration and criminal justice. Um, but she comes at it, which is what this conversation is about, through a deep religious spiritual lens, because that's who she is. Um, and she helps to support and organize powerful African-American ministers all across the country. Um, so it's a delight to have her here, and I'm looking forward to the conversation. So uh, Dr. Carruthers, Iva, welcome. Thank you so very much. So to get started, uh, one of the things I was talking to Iva about, she's done many things, and you'll see it in the bio, or if you go to the Proctor Conference, um, she spoke at the UN about some of the issues that are pressing on this country, and particularly, again, incarceration, uh, or issues of race. So could you tell us briefly about what you talked about and the setting for that? After about 19 years, the United Nations declared that they would have a international meeting on global drug policy. And as uh, a part of that, the non-governmental organization or the NGO community um, began to organize around uh, a mantra of do no harm. Do no harm meaning moving away from the punitive practices in terms of drug use that um, becomes the ways in which, particularly in this country, the war on drugs has been implemented to a, a paradigm of compassion and care. So in my role as General Secretary of the Samuel DeWitt Proctor Conference, I was able to help to facilitate creating an interfaith space where we found common ground in a diversity of religious traditions to talk about what it meant to embrace a concept of do no harm, what it meant to prioritize compassion and care as the paradigm to address the consequences, the collateral damage of the horrific kinds of ways in which people are suffering um, with oppression as a result of drug policy. So thank you. Um, so Iva's done things that we are all trying to do. She's brought deep faith, spiritual, religious uh, life to social justice and the two are not separate. Uh, she's done the bridging that we're talking about. And she's put it into practice, not just into words. Uh, so I wanna go more deeply into that. And I'm gonna ask you a question that may sound like it's not a bridging question, but it is. Um, so we're dealing with drug policy. Mm -hmm. And the United States, for a whole host of reasons, is one of the most unhealthy rich countries in the world and you talk about the collateral damage, and you get to think about the collateral damage of othering is to create an unhealth, unhealthy society for everyone. Despite that, the latest drug academic, epidemic that we're facing in the country is happening largely in the poor white community. Mm -hmm. uh, poor whites are killing themselves. The, the increased uh, suicide rate from opium drugs in the poor white community especially whites who are middle-aged and only have a high school education, is alarming. And part of a larger malaise that's facing our country. Um, so one of the things that I, and I'm, and I'm pleased in many ways that we are at least beginning to show some caring and compassion. But at the same time, 
the Attorney General is talking about doubling down on the war on drugs in the black community. So here's, here's the question, here's the hard part of the question. We do have to be willing to reach out to our white brothers and sisters who are high school graduates who are suffering. And the country is starting to do that. We actually, you can't go a week without seeing something in a major news outlet about the lives of these communities that humanize them. We get to know them by their name. We're invited to their living room. We're, they're suffering. It's explicated. We know about their suffering. And we're told we as a country have to respond to this deep crisis, this health crisis, this crisis of despair. And I think that's right. But then when we turn to the black community, all that compassion goes away. And we're no longer talking about a crisis of despair. We're no longer talking about a health problem. We're back to a criminal justice problem. Uh, so my concern is that even as we apparently began to show compassion toward one community, we exercise this old habit of saying, but not those others. So how do we hold that? What should, how should we be thinking about that? And, and particularly, what's the bridging and spiritual response to that? That's a very complex uh, question and commentary, John. Uh, in my experience, and I, I want to begin with a personal narrative because I think it might help um, for me at least to think about this conversation. Um, in, my, in my ministry tradition of Christianity, there's the scripture, uh, be still and know that I am God. Uh, in another way of saying it in the context of Buddhism, uh, we can just think about the notion of mindfulness and the capacity to say to someone else, namaste, I see you. Uh, we translate that in South Africa as the notion of Ubuntu, I am because we are. Um, I came to ministry um, on a trajectory where when people read my bio, they wonder how I got there. And that's the part I want to share. Okay. So I'm a trained sociologist, and so as a person in sociology with a focus on race and ethnicity, I did a lot of work around that area in the early 70s, late 60s, and uh, part of that trajectory got me engaged in studying the Human Genome Project. I also uh, experienced at a very deep personal level my father being the oldest patient to get a kidney transplant. And the day that that um, actually happened in terms of his surgery, which he did survive, which was amazing, um, I was in the waiting room with 17 hours of surgery. At that time, you could not have pain medication after the surgery. I looked down and the magazine, the medical magazine, JAMA's cover said, aging is a disease. And it became clear to me that there was a personal tension between what it meant to think about these things intellectually in terms of sociology and then to think and experience them personally in terms of understanding a culture in which aging became a disease. It was very antithetical to my sense of spirituality. And I got engaged with looking at the role of technology in how societies are transformed. A mother of two sons, I was also concerned about violence. Then my definition of violence was Pac-Man. So if anybody knows Pac-Man, you can understand that when we talk about the violence today, there's certainly this great disparity. But I wanted to address that, and so I developed software um, to teach and to prove that you could develop instructional software to teach soft skills, how we relate and engage in one another, building on the curriculum of inter-ethnic understanding of the ethnic contributions that different groups had made to what it is that we call this America. It was out of that and understanding, as I said to IBM, that when we think about the use of technology as it relates to children and instructional technology, that there was a premise that I had that America's diversity would either be its Achilles heel 
or it could be its competitive edge. And what I saw in the increasing gap between uh, technology, those who had it and those who didn't, is that we were moving towards a trajectory in which the technology was going to widen the gap. All of that ultimately sent me to seminary. One morning <laughs> I woke up and I said, there's got to be some more answers to this in terms of my quest for putting together what it meant to deconstruct racialized structures of analysis in terms of society and how that then relates to what it means to being human. And so my journey more deeply into theology um, is where I landed and now 15 years later I'm serving as a facilitator leader over the Samuel DeWitt Proctor Conference. In answer to your question, spirituality for me, and I think we can think about this triangular understanding that theology, that is what it means to be human in relationship to how you view something that is transcendent or beyond you, is foundational to all community. And that theology then informs what we call the anthropology, that is how I see you, namaste, do I accept your humanity. And that then begins to inform how we think of one another in relationship to humanity, and who is human, and by human meaning who is worthy who is worthy to be the recipient of that which we define as good and resources in relationship to society. So theology informs our anthropology, which informs our sociology. It is with a notion of that um, triangular relationship that spirituality becomes, I think, very important to what it means for us to commit to this work that we call justice. So when you wake up in the morning, there is some force that propels you that is larger than yourself and is certainly larger than data. So I want to celebrate you for having this kind of conversation where you put a charge out for us to think about in the language of the academy, ontology, when we talk about axiology in terms of our values, when we talk about um, the notion of epistemology, how we know what we know. Um, you have said to us, John, in so many ways, which is so important, that understanding othering and belonging means to understand that there is something bigger than us, and more often than not, there are those unconscious ways in which we are relating to one another which is much larger than the consciousness that we walk around with. So breaking through those barriers in terms of being able to relate to one another, for me and my tradition, is a measurement of how far we move. And in some ways, I'm learning more important, a more important measurement than even the policy shifts that we make. Thank you. So there's a, there's a book I read recently and participated in a panel back in New York I think it's online, so you might be able to see it. The book is called Happiness for All. Mm -hmm. And um, the reason I mentioned the book is the book is looking at indices of happiness um, as well as self-reporting. And it won't surprise you that America, in terms of a rich country, mm -hmm. is very unhappy. Uh, it may surprise some of you that people who call themselves Democrats are less happy than people who call themselves Republicans, which is kind of interesting because in terms of anger, Republicans are angrier than Democrats. So it's an interesting play. But the reason I mentioned that book is that in terms of, it looks at a number of different cohorts, whites, blacks, Asians, Latinos, I don't think they cover Native Americans. It actually looks at 40 different countries and it's looking at different subgroups as well. And by and large, people's sense of well-being, people's sense of ease, is related socioeconomically. So the, the people who are struggling, poor, are so distressed by life that they don't have a sense of ease. Mm -hmm. And part of being middle class is knowing where your food's going to come from, knowing you have a house, and so you have a little more breathing room. 
here's the wrinkle in the book. Uh, so generally whites are more at ease in that respect than blacks or Latinos. And then there's a wrinkle in the book. The group that's by far the most at ease of all the cohorts are older black people. And the author, which I talked to, said, well, what's that about? And she's like, I don't, actually, we don't know. Mm. That kind of surprised us. What they got to be so happy about? Uh, <laughs> and so they have to do more research, but this is what she posits, that, uh, which is consistent with other research, that older black Americans, these are mainly Americans, are more likely to be in relationship. They're more likely to be in relationship with family and community, and they're more likely to have a religious or spiritual grounding. Mm -hmm. That those two things alone, they don't have more money, they don't have fancy cars, they don't live in the best neighborhoods, but those two things alone, she posits, takes them off the chart. And so the idea of belonging shows up as being incredibly powerful in terms of outcome. And I, I wonder if you could comment on that, because I think, um, you know, we forget how important that we're not just economic creatures. Um, and even when we talk, and I said this, when we talk about self-care, I wince a little bit when I hear that. Because care to me, and I'm not saying I'm not responsible for whatever, running or swimming or eating, but really care happens in a community. Mm -hmm. It doesn't happen in isolation. That when you are isolated, you have more negative outcomes than, a, than obesity, diabetes, and high blood pressure. Uh, and part, so the pose, part of the reason people are thinking that whites, low-income whites are killing themselves at such a high rate is that they are in some way isolated. And the reason that older blacks aren't killing themselves, suicide is extremely low among older blacks, um, is because of this connection to spirituality and religion and community. Could you comment on that? Well, I think if we were to look at the data from a purely objective point of view, there's um, evidence that it would be okay to ask the question, how do you explain that people of African descent are still here? So I think it is a fundamental a connection between resiliency that resides in African culture, which relates to communal and well-being being related to how are you in the context of community. Uh, by example, in the Maasai community in Kenya, you wake up and you don't say, how are you, John? You say, how are the children? The children representing the future is an indication of the well-being of the community. In the Congo, your expression is you live under the canopy of God. And with that understanding that all of us are living under the canopy of God, you have a different understanding of what it means for creation care in terms of the natural environment. There was something on that experience of the slave ship that Howard Thurman was in quest for in terms of his understanding of spirituality. And he asked the question of what manner of spirit must my people have had in order to survive what is called the transatlantic slave trade. It is that manner of spirit which allowed for the reintegration of identity, I think, despite the diversity of the places and the languages from which people came, that is with us today in terms of the black church, for example. And in the black church, there is this notion that there is a distinction between happiness and joy. So happiness is related to the material things, but joy is something that God and you have in relationship to God that cannot be taken from you. And so in answer to your question, I find it interesting that I just finished the book called Joy, a conversation between the Dalai Lama and Bishop Tutu. And I would suggest you get it. And one of the most powerful pieces for me was at the end of the book when the Dalai Lama said to Bishop Tutu as they were departing, both 
being older, knowing it may be the last time they see each other. The Dalai Lama said, when I meet the moment of death, I hope I see your face. Mm. And so it's that notion of being in community with one another. It's that notion of what it means to build relationships around a notion that my well-being is related to your well-being. Ubuntu, I am because we are. It is that notion of collective um, suffering and collective celebration that I think explains why older black women in particular find a sense of joy slash happiness despite. And that has been a part of our resistance and a part of our resilience. Thank you. So I want to share something very quickly and then ask you another question about that. Um, so there's two, piece, two pieces I want to share with you. So I, I've been talking about suicide and the suicide rate in the country, by far the highest suicide rate in the country is when the made, native population, mm -hmm. uh, higher than any other group. And by some statistics, the suicide rate for native community went down to close to zero in the midst of Standing Rock. And again, people don't know why. Um, but in, in, the, in the midst of people being engaged in struggle, it seems to me that at least life and meaning collectively related to the earth dissipated all the other stuff they were dealing with. And so the other personal thing I'd like to share with you um, is my father is 96. And many of you heard me talk about my father many times. Uh, grew up um, as a sharecropper, dropped out of school in the third grade. Um, some people feel like I can take complex ideas and make them accessible. And I, I hope I, have, I can do that. I try to do that. I'm not trying to hide the ball. Uh, I think it's probably more obvious when I speak than my writing. Uh, my writing, sometimes people say it's not so accessible. But anyway, that's another <laughs> story. Uh, but part of it is translating to my father, who dropped out of school in the third grade, who's barely literate. So last summer, I was overseas, and I got a call saying, you have to come home. Uh, dad is dying. Uh, and he was in Henry Ford's hospital. And the head of Henry Ford's hospital is from Oakland. So I called the guy, good guy, and I said, I know you care about all your patients, but my dad is in your hospital. Make sure he gets the best care possible. And he said, I will. Uh, and after a week or two, they, the hospital said, we've done everything we can. He had taken a fall. His, his brain is actually starting to liquefy. Um, we need to send him home so he can die. Uh, and my father was like, okay with that. He had lost all function. He, could, he couldn't talk anymore, uh, lost control of his um, you know, internal organs, couldn't eat. And so I have a wonderful family. And we all went home. My kids went there. And there was this constant vigil. Someone was my dad all the time. Mm. Uh, and um, so one day my dad woke up and I'm in the room and my sister's there with me and she said, Dad, do you see who's here? He looks up and said, do you know who that is? Because his memory was starting to fade. He said, that's my baby son. Um, fast forward. Uh, I'm going to leave, and my dad is now talking. He can talk hard. He said, John, I said, yeah, Dad, I hope you're not disappointed, but I don't think I'm going to die right now. <laughs> the doctors say it doesn't make sense. His brain was starting to liquefy. Um, and the only thing I can think of mm -hmm. is that the family and the love of the family called him back to life. So what I want to ask, uh, and we have many experiences like this. I, I just one of them. My dad almost died another time, 
And he asked my mother, he said, Florcy, the pain is too, too much, I'm ready to go. And my mom said, you better grow up, you ain't leaving here. That's right, no you're not. <laughs> and my dad didn't leave. But my point is, how do we take these experiences in the black community, in the native community, how do we share them so it's not a story just about the black community? So it's not a story just about the native community? Because one of the things, I think we do have to tell our story and our suffering and our history, but too often we do it in a way that it, other people feel like they don't have a road in, or sometimes they become a negative part of the story. How do we actually share our deep stories, our deep traditions in a way that opens up bridges and connections? Well, I think some of it begins with truth telling and not making assumptions about one another that other people don't have stories to tell. Some of it begins, I think, with a paradigm shift where we think differently about the nature of the questions that we are asking. And I think that that's why this conference is so important because we're putting some different questions out there to answer. And part of those questions have to do with the, um, perhaps for at least us in this point of Western civilization has to do with our understanding of the relationship not just between uh, the data and sociology and the psychology and the neurosciences that we talked about in the last session, but really the relationship as well to uh, spirituality and to the role of religious practice as it informs how we um, are and able to sustain suffering in the midst of the lived experience. And your dad's experience um, can be probably told in the experiences of many African-American families. I think when we start looking more deeply at what we're learning about neurosciences, what we're learning about epigenetics, what we're learning about children who are held at the point of birth, who were destined to, quote, die, but because somebody went and held them day after day after day, they began to turn around and show new signs of life from an incubator, suggests to us that there is this much deeper level where, to the point of your experience, communal, family, prayer, and love has energy to be a intervention. So what I would like for us to consider is the extent to which if we were to bridge and share our narratives that we create this paradigm shift, both in terms of our understanding and in terms of reality, to envision another world. See, I think part of what we have as a problem is that we spend so much time trying to change policy and shifts based on an assumption that the world has to stay the way it is structurally that we miss the opportunity to use our creative genius and innovation, our possibilities to change the world and transform the world and those structures because we believe that something else is possible. So I have one more question for you and we have a little time and then I'm gonna give you a chance to ask me some questions if you'd like. Okay. Um, we've been pushing this great big family to bridge, and I know that's not easy, I, uh, bridge with people who are not necessarily like us in some obvious way. I um, uh, heard an earlier panel just before lunch of really great speakers and uh, talking about the progressive movement, and I wanna make it clear from my perspective, this is not a progressive conference. This is a conference about belonging. Uh, and we have, uh, when we say a new social compact, we actually try to say what our values are. Our values are about love, our values about caring, our values about the earth, our values about life. If that's progressive, fine. But if someone who, who's not progressive, who's willing to sign on to those values, that's fine too. Uh, and so one of the critiques, and I'm sure we'll have many or others, is that people say, so where are the Republicans? Um, and we actually, in terms of the organizing committee, talked about a, inviting a few prominent Republicans. Uh, and my measurement would not be, are they progressive or conservative? 
are they Republican or Democrat? All I think structures matter. But are they, do they have similar values about the preciousness of life? Uh, and so while I push us and push myself to sort of keep thinking about that and pushing that, I wonder if it's coming from the other end. I wonder if the people who self-identify as Republican or as conservative, as rural whites, if they are struggling with trying to figure out how to bridge with me, how to bridge with us. Because, uh, you know, if you build a bridge in one direction and there's no connection to the other, you still don't have what we need to have. And I know in your work in the church, you work a lot with, uh, you're grounded in the black church, but what about the white church? Is there, is there a movement in both directions to really come together and connect at this deep level and build something together? I think that we certainly see evidence that there is a movement of conversations um, going across both ways. I would like to celebrate the uh, way in which, for example, the Kellogg Foundation has taken a real stance to prioritize this whole issue of truth telling as foundational to a process of healing and transformation, not just for this nation, but for the world. And so this notion of deconstructing racial hierarchy and hierarchies of human value where some people are viewed to be more worthy, more human than others, I think is a point at which given the political environment, despite the labels, given the political environment in terms of its collective consequence on us as a nation, you now have a much more fertile ground where I find um, white clergy leadership, white church leadership, mainline church leadership is being intentional about creating spaces to have this conversation. I think that black churches are receptive to it, but remindful, are mindful that we have had this conversation, in the words of William Barber, at least two times before, and this is the third reconstruction. So what does it mean to remember the Kerner Report, which said this society was moving towards two societies, one black and one white? And that was a historic moment in which we had a choice to make. We're now at another historic place where we have a choice to make. And that, for me, suggests that we have to create communities like this, where we're not labeling people in the ways that you have suggested, but that rather we are thinking very deeply about what it means to be human, fundamentally. And what that looks like is our understanding of what are the indicators of a society which submits its will to the will of personalities that are narcissistic, personalities that are authoritarian, personalities that are, are removed from reality in such a way that they take advantage based on people's fears and anxieties to create a kind of environment that allows for genocide to occur. And we are at that place, I think, in this nation. And that we have got to decide where we're going to fit in what I call the challenge of moral and ethical interruption of evil. To be able to name the evil, to be able to understand the relationship of certain behaviors in which a society begins to consciously and unconsciously dehumanize, demonize, create um, what you would call linguistic euphemisms to normalize behavior that is evil. And I see this both on the side of the quote progressives and the conservatives so that where there are opportunities for us to challenge the normalization of evil, we do that rather than naming the evil. And so when you look at the research about how genocide can happen, and I'm talking about in a global context, 
ordinary people are complicit in it because we were silent. And, and I, I might add, that's not political. That's moral and spiritual. So Absolutely. having a moral and spiritual and value grounding tells us where to stand, but not because someone's Democrat or Republican, but because we stand with life. Um, we have only a few minutes left. Do you have any questions of me? I do. So I, I celebrate, um, I, I was in the last session, John, and I, and I heard you talk about um, the remembrance, and I do some sacred memory work too, so you benchmark things and you understand that these kinds of conversations ought to be understood as sacred. Um, but you gave us the remembrance around um, taking the thought of implicit bias and where it was and where it is now. Um, and I, I want to understand where you're going next in terms of what you see as the way we need to frame this conversation of othering and belonging. Well, two things very quickly. So some of you heard Naila, uh, she introduced me uh, at the, uh, the first day, or actually the first morning, and she talked about uh, one of the things that she asked me at a dinner, it's like, how do you know so many things about, how do you know so much about so many things? Uh, actually, what she said to me at dinner was not so nice. She said, do you really know all those things? You're just bullshitting people. <laughs> She cleaned it up for y'all. Uh, <laughs> uh, and what I said to her is that I, I try to listen to people and give them back what they say. Uh, I, I, when I read even, I read sometimes five or six books and I have the authors in the books in conversation with each other. Mm -hmm. So I have a conversation with you and I have a conversation with Bell Hooks and I have a conversation with Reverend Barber and I have a conversation with people and I, I put them in conversation with each other and then I share with all of y'all. So you're sort of listening to the conversation. Um, but the, the, the point that you made in terms of, first of all, I was also looking at sometimes the tension between blacks and Latinos and between straights and gays between, and I realized that deep down we have a fundamental need to belong. And to me, sort of the grounding of spirituality are the right set of relationships. Mm -hmm. Right set of relationships with the earth, if you're theist, with God, with each other, with oneself. Uh, and it's not an isolation. It's not power over. And so I sort of looked for language for that and also looked for research on that. And that's how we sort of came up with the idea of othering and belonging, that the de dehumanizing process, and Maya, uh, Maya Angela talked about this. She said, um, you know, we've studied for years what uh, slavery has done to black people. Mm -hmm. We haven't paid attention to what it's done to white people. Exactly. The dehumanizing that goes on in the white community because they dehumanize others. Right. Uh, so to me that was very helpful. And just to start to think about how do we actually create this circle of human concern that not just for humans but for all life, respect. And in doing so, we don't not only claim each other, we claim different aspects of ourselves. Right. Um, and to me, that's profoundly political, but more importantly, it's profoundly spiritual and ontological. Uh, and I look forward to being part of this journey with all of you and others, uh, and at the same time, rejecting those who would commit genocide, whether it's genocide to the earth, genocide to the fish, genocide to Native Americans. Um, and I'll end just by saying this. There was a debate right after the election and sometimes people would say, you know what? It doesn't matter to my community who is president. And my response was, that's wrong on virtually every level. So whether you're black, whether you're white, if we as a country took serious to deport 11 million people, and you can call them Latinos, you can call them whatever, it would be catastrophic for the whole country. And so to understand when there is really serious harm going on to any community, it really is a harm to all of us. And so my objective in that is not just being, quote unquote, an ally with Latinos, it's that that offends the core sensibility of my humanness and to stand up for that. So we have to end, but I wanna thank you for having a wonderful conversation. I wanna thank all of you for engaging in this uh, beautiful but hard work. Uh, and I think 
uh, we have a difficult time, but we also have a blessed time. So I hope that we'll have a lot of transformation and a lot of joy as we go forward. So thank you. Thank you.